It is my pleasure to welcome Greg Easterbrook to this podium. Mr. Easterbrook will be discussing his most recent book entitled, It's Better Than It Looks, Reason for Optimism in an Age of Fear. In addition to his books, his writings have appeared in The Atlantic, The New Yorker, Science, Wired, Wall Street Journal, and The Los Angeles Times. And for the football fans among us, you may be familiar with his celebrated weekly NFL column, Tuesday Morning Quarterback, now appearing in the Weekly Standard. This is the book I want to talk about. The headline makes it the main point of the book pretty obvious. Uh, sometimes when, you, when, when, you, when you're doing an intellectual argument, it's easiest to start by saying what it isn't. So let me start by saying what this isn't. Uh, to say it's better than it looks and to make a case for optimism is not the same as saying that everything is fine. Everything is not fine. The world is full of problems. There's a lot of things you should be worried about. There's a lot of things you should be upset or cynical about. There's a lot of things going on in the world that you should be angry about. So I don't say that you shouldn't be angry, that you shouldn't be cynical. I expect you to be. This book is also not a claim that we should be cheerful. If you want to be cheerful, that's great. I hope you are. Go around the world with a smile on your face. An optimist can be a cynical person. An optimist can be very upset reading the newspaper in the morning. You don't have to be cheerful, you don't have to, it's nice if you smile, but you don't have to. Whether you feel pessimistic or optimistic about the world has two levels. One is the, just a choice that you make. You read the news, you hear what's going on, you decide, am I gonna be optimistic? Am I gonna be angry and depressed? That's a choice that you make. The news does not dictate those things to you. But whatever choice you make ought to be based on a, on a full factual appreciation of what's going on in life. And a full factual appreciation is pretty encouraging because I, I hope I can be able to show you in a few minutes practically everything that we can measure about the United States is positive and has been positive for years, if not decades. And not the entire world, but most of the larger world, most of what we can measure about the larger world is positive and in many cases has been positive for decades. So if you acknowledge those things, there's still a lot to worry about. There's still a lot to be angry about. And there are always going to be people who are of terrible circumstances, in either individuals or, depending on where you go in the world, entire groups. There's never going to be a time when there isn't someone who's lonely or stressed for money or sick or unhappy. I mean, unless there's a second Garden of Eden, there'll never be a time without that. But there, but there can be a time when basic problems of human life are fun, when the material problems of life are solved, and I think we've gone a lot closer to that than people, people realize. Um, in order to present the thesis of this book to you in a timely manner, let me do a couple of things. First, make a political point. This book is not mainly about politics, it's mainly about other things. And, and then hit you with a lot of statistics, uh, and then ask why we're, so many of us are so negative about life. And then because this is the Carnegie Council, we will always, of course, conclude by asking, but what does it all mean? Uh, the, the, first thing I'll, the first point that I'll make is the political one. On the day that the United States elected Donald Trump president, 63 million people voted for a guy who told you that the world was falling apart, just to quote a few things that he said in the week before the election, everything in America is always bad. It's always down, down, down. He told an audience in Colorado two days before the election that the country is in the worst shape that it's ever been in its entire history. On the day that 63 million people believed that, the country was actually in the best shape that it's ever been in its history by a pretty significant margin. And I, I think now it's in a better shape than it was on the day of election. Trump aside, everything else has gone pretty well. And yet he was able to convince 63 million people that the country was falling apart. And you can say, well, we make this choice, you want to be optimistic, you want to be pessimistic. pessimistic. That's just a personal choice. On some level it is. But in November of 2016, it backfired on the country. People's willingness to believe that everything was terrible as a factual truth caused us to get Donald Trump as president. And it wasn't just here. The same sequence of events happened in the United Kingdom, which voted for Brexit in, in, in the year since the founding of the European Union. There's been no Europe on Europe war. 
after how many centuries of constant war? There's been prosperity in almost all European Union members. And yet people were convinced that the European Union is, is a horrible thing that we have to get rid of. I'll argue that the, that the belief that the world is worse than it is and almost the desire to believe that the world is worse than it is, it definitely predates Donald Trump. Um, but in 2016, it backfired on us by giving us Trump and to, to a lesser extent also giving us Brexit, which you know, maybe Brexit can be reversed. Trump is another matter. Here's the lots of statistics moment of this talk, and I'll go through them as quickly as I can. And I'll assure you that, of course, as, you, as you've already guessed, Incredible detail in the book, plus source citations for everything. Okay, so the things that we can measure about the, I'll talk mainly about the United States and Western Europe, but most of these trends apply to most, although of course not all of the world. All forms of disease, including cancer and heart disease, are in long-term decline. Compared to population size, last year the United States had 75% fewer heart attack fatalities than it had just two generations ago. Longevity has been steadily rising for more than a century everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world. Not only is our longevity at record levels, China's longevity is at record levels, Afghanistan's longevity is at record levels. Everybody is living longer with less disease. The graph of rising longevity looks like an escalator, just endlessly going up. And there's no reason to think that's going to stop, even, even when terrible things happen. And lots of terrible things happen in the United States. They, you've read about opiate overdose deaths. It's a, it's a terrible trend in public health. But even when you take that into account, longevity continues to increase. The whole world is riding this longevity increase escalator. All forms of pollution other than greenhouse gases are in long-term decline for years, in some cases for decades. Now, greenhouse gases, very important asterisk that we're going to spend a little time on later. But, 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 but to quickly summarize, in the United States, Last 25 years, acid rain is down 21%. Winter smog is down 77%. Summer smog is down 22%. This is happening during a period when the United States population rose by 28%. So we would expect pollution to increase, instead pollution declined. Water pollution figures are, are roughly the same. Violent crime is in a generation-long cycle of decline. Poll shook Donald Trump when he was campaigning for office, constantly said there's a crime wave, our cities are living hell. For some reason, that's what voters wanted to believe. Polls showed that for the last 20 years, Americans have consistently said crime is worse than the previous year. Actually, it's gone down compared to the previous year. In the United States and in most but not all other countries of the world, violence is declining. Criminal violence is declining, so is military violence. War is in a generation long cycle of decline. This may seem hard to believe based on the tenor of cable news, but the frequency and intensity of combat both have declined almost on a linear basis for 25 years. And that's even if you take into account civilian deaths caused directly by combat or indirectly by, by blockades and similar effects of combat. Last 25 years, death from war have declined to about 5% of the rate of deaths from war that prevailed per year of the, the rate that prevailed for the previous century. In each one of the last 25 years, a person's chance, any person's chance, not my chance and your chance, but anybody, any in the, anywhere in the world, chance of dying has been at the lowest level of human history. And this is even though the population keeps rising, we normally think of population stress as causing combat. It's not causing combat right now. And even though the world is full of guns, the, uh, the chances that someone will shoot one of them at you goes steadily down. Now, this, 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 I'm only talking about a period of 25 years. Maybe this is too, too little time to be sure. Today, there are 86% fewer nuclear weapons in the world than there were 30 years ago. The doomsday threat has declined by 86% in just 30 years. We hope it will decline more, but if you think about U.S.-Russian relations, now it, uh, they're so zany, I don't even know what the proper adjective is to describe them, but, but whatever, whatever the Kremlin and the White House are saying to each other today, communicating by smartphone instead of by, by red phone, meanwhile, the two START treaties that require the disassembly and melting of nuclear weapons parts are still being scrupulously observed by both sides. Both sides are abiding by the terms of the biggest arms control treaty in the history of the world. And day-to-day -day life goes on anyway. There's no reason anybody should 
to think, well, you know, I still have to, I still have to go to work in the morning. I still have to make lunch, etc. This to me is a wonderful trend. The doomsday threat declines every day, instead of enlarging, instead of rising every day. A couple more big statistics. Food supply has not become a crisis as everyone thought it would 25, 30 years ago. Instead, as of last year, the United Nations said that malnutrition was at the lowest level in all of human history. Malnutrition last year was 15 to 20 percent of the planet. That's still a huge number of people considering how large the human family is. But just a generation ago, malnutrition was 50 percent of a much smaller human family. Now it's down to a smaller number. It's expected to decline again this year. The economy drives everybody crazy, but it continues to grow almost everywhere in the world. And an important point to remember about, about income and wages, since though they were so contentious in the 2016 campaign, both, both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders constantly said the middle class is being pummeled, wages are falling, there are no jobs. On the day that Trump was elected, unemployment was 4.6%, a number that would have caused policymakers of the 1970s to fall to their knees and kiss the ground. Uh, the unemployment picture is really good and has been for a number of years, but so is, so is the middle class buying power picture if you figure it this way. If you only look at pre-tax income, that's been a tough number for the middle class now for about 30 years. If that's the only number you look at, and that's the only number that Bernie Sanders ever talked about, then it looks pretty bleak. But you don't run your household based on only income. Your, your, your buying power is based on income minus taxes plus benefits multiplied by consumer prices divided by household size. And if you do that equation, what you find is that ever since the end of World War II, the middle class's buying power has risen by just about exactly 3% per year. Uh, again, almost like an escalator basis, same amount every year, straight line. If times are good, if times are bad, middle class buying power rise goes up 3% per year. And of course, you know from mathematics, if something goes up 3% per year, it takes you 26 years to double. So that is still ongoing. Uh, pundits and politicians talk only about income. Income is the negative number when you, when you look at wages. All the other numbers are positive. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that they will stay that way. The economy is so turbulent and so unpredictable. Even if you have a good year, it drives you crazy. And I, I think one reason people feel so worried about the economy is things change so fast. Now, they've, they have changed fast in the past. There, you can look at the 19th century, and I give some examples here from the 19th century where, where people and organizations, industries, areas of the country were worried that change was coming too quickly. There's no doubt that it comes even faster now, and that makes you feel uncertain and anxious about the future. But so far, the economy is still grinding out higher living standards for almost everyone. Generations alive today in almost any nation of the world are better off in material terms than any generation of the past, and are likely, although of course not certain, but they're likely to be better off in the future as well. And the most important fact that we're not sufficiently aware of is that global poverty is declining really fast. Uh, if you look at global poverty in the numbers, there's a few quick ones. 150 years ago, 90% of the world lived in extreme poverty by the World Bank definition of income of $1.90 per day. And of course, the statistics I'll give you all converted to current dollars to make the comparisons meaningful. Sometime in the 1970s, the world got to only half the human population living in extreme poverty, and that was considered an incredible achievement. Uh, last year, it was 9%. We're down to 9% of the human population living in extreme poverty. And this incredible reduction of extreme poverty has occurred as the human family has gotten larger and larger and larger, when you would have expected extreme poverty to get worse. Instead, it's lessened. Now, we can't see that from the United States or from when you're voting on Brexit, you can't see it from the United Kingdom. The, the line I use about this is that the great things are happening in the world, just not here. We're, 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 we're aware of the conditions in our own country. It doesn't seem so great. Progress doesn't seem to be accelerating to us. Go to China, you go to India, progress is accelerating all around you. And because the human family has become so large, more members of the human family live in those places than live in here in, in Western Europe combined. Polls show, by the way, that when you ask Americans and Western Europeans, is developing world poverty getting better or worse, they say by an overwhelming margin, margin that developing world poverty is getting worse, which is the reverse of what's going on. Well, we seem to think the reverse of what's going on on a number of 
of topics. Americans think crime is getting worse, they think the economy is falling apart, et cetera, et cetera. Well, why do people believe the reverse of what's happening? One reason is just the relentlessly negative impression given by cable news and social channels, which exist to overstate anger and discord and negative news. That's how they call attention to themselves. It's certainly true that the press has always called attention to itself by emphasizing the negative. You look at newspapers from the 1880s and you'll see the front page of the paper is all f fires and crimes. And if you want to flip through and find out what's going on in other nations or other states, you've got to go to the middle of the paper. So it's not new that, that the media emphasizes the negative. But now we have these new forms of media all around us. They're very felicitous in terms of quickly getting messages to large numbers of people. And they are also emphasizing the negative. I think people want to believe the worst because they think that optimism means complacency. One of the big messages that I try to get across in this book is that optimism is not complacency. Optimists don't think la-di-da, everything's going to be fine. Optimism is the belief that problems can be solved. That's the fundamental difference between optimism and, and pessimism. But people think, you say, oh, I'm an optimist, that means you've got this sunny disposition. You think everything's okay. You think it's okay that Trump is president. You think it's okay that there are school shootings. No, optimists don't think that's okay. They just think that there are possible reforms to, that can do something about this. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll quickly go through this because you've probably heard some of this material from other commentators in recent months. The, if you look at polling data, Pew and Gallup both poll on the question of do you think the country is headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? Are you satisfied or dissatisfied with how things are changing in the United States? From the end of World War II to the year 2004, Americans were always positive on that poll. I like the direction of the country. I think things are getting better. People said this even in the aftermath of 9-11. Since 2004, the majority has been consistently negative. This is the 168th consecutive month where Americans have told both Pew and Gallup that they are unhappy and dissatisfied with the condition of the country, despite all those wonderful facts I just threw at you. Well, what else happened in 2004? That's the year that Facebook went into business. Now, of course you know that the fact that two events happen at the same time does not establish that one caused the other. But I think in this case, there's a lot of relationship, and not just, right, lately it's been, been, it's been trendy to pile on Facebook. I would like to pile on Facebook, but also to all other similar social media platforms. They've all come into existence in that period. This thing, that the, the iPhone came into existence in 2007. Not only did it enable Millions of people to express their opinions very quickly, which is wonderful. You've got to respect the democratization of opinion. But it also enabled millions of people to say things that were not in any way fact-checked or that were not in any way true. And making no distinction whatsoever between things that are true, things that might be true, things that contain a grain of truth, and things that are totally made up. Most of you probably read the New York Times. There are mornings when I want to throw the New York Times against the wall. And yet I'm always confident that there's been an internal argument at the Times about whether this story is fair and reflects the truth. The stuff you see on your phone, there's never any internal discussion about whether it's fair, it reflects the truth. In fact, it's more likely to draw clicks if it's made up and completely phony. So we have this new media environment just since 2004 with the arrival of Facebook that not only emphasizes reasons to feel bad about your life and your, yourself and your society, but that is not fact check in any way whatsoever. And where do we perceive this? This close to our faces. Facebook was originally something for your desk, those old cathode ray tube computers that sat on your desk. E even the guys who designed Facebook didn't realize that it was going to go like this, literally right next to their face. That, that wasn't what they meant with the name, but that's what's happened since. So we're not only getting a constant stream of bad news that's completely unedited, we're physically holding it close to our faces. And your New York Times, like it or hate it, it sits on the table. If you get up and go somewhere else, the New York Times does not follow you through the house. If you've got the, if you've got the news on on your television set, the television set sits on a counter around the wall, the television set doesn't walk behind you as you go through your house, your phone follows you through the house. The bad news purveyor is physically on your person constantly. And so from the same moment that social media came on the scene, we started feeling bad about ourselves. 
And whatever else Donald Trump is, he's the greatest self-promoter in world history, he realized that he could use that dynamic to go all the way to the White House and he was successful. Suppose I'm right, that most objective returns are positive for most people and that today's generation lives better than any previous generation of the past and tomorrow's generation is better to live, likely to live better than today's generation does. What are, what are the implications of that? Suppose I'm right. Well, the fact that things are improving certainly isn't just good luck. Positive trends don't come down from out of the sky. There are tangible reasons that things are improving. And the most primary one I go through a lot in this book, but the most primary one is that reform is much more effective than generally understood. Political reforms, social reforms that have to do with how we treat each other at home, social settings in the workplace, technological reforms that have to do with how we build things. Their reforms are much more effective than we think. Reforms in the past have almost always led to improved outcomes. So I, I both spend some time trying to derive what the lessons learned would be from the reforms that have been successful in air pollution, health, discrimination, etc. And then say, how do you apply those to the problems of today? My core finding is that optimism is the best argument for reform. Because you, if, you, if you're an optimist and you look at the past, you say, geez, things were a lot worse and then they got better. So let's reform things again because there's reasonable reason to believe that reforms will be successful. That's the optimistic lesson that you draw from, especially from the post-war era in the Western world, but, but really from the post-war era almost everywhere in the world. Uh, and I think once we address climate change, inequality, I think we can actually fix those things. We'll wonder why we didn't do it sooner. Now some other problem will come along that will seem daunting and we'll figure out a way to, to fix that too. Um, I'll tell you one last thing and then I'll take questions. Originally the title of this book was The Arrow of History. Public affairs books thought the original title was, sounded too much like an academic tome. And you know what, they were right about that. I, I think they came up with a better title than that. But why did I call it The Arrow of History? Um, the original title was a play on something said by Franklin Roosevelt shortly before he died. This is an, a, a 1945 FDR quote. FDR was the most accomplished reformer of the last century. And he said, and I and just in the original title changed the word trend to arrow because I thought it sounded classier. But anyway, Roosevelt said, the great fact to remember is that the trend of civilization is forever upward. Well, FDR was right then and he's right today. We've forgotten this great fact. We need to remember it, both to have a fuller appreciation of our own lives and to argue for the next round of reforms to come. Thanks. Why do you think people wanted to believe Donald Trump, that everything was so bad? The want to believe is a very puzzling question. I propose in this book that there are four basic ways of knowing. One is certainty. The sun is 93 million miles from the earth. We're certain of that. There's nothing to talk about. Another is faith versus doubt. We can neither prove nor disprove the existence of God. We can speculate, but based, based on current knowledge, the question of does God exist is impossible to answer or to refute. Maybe at some point in the future it will be, but this is, this is a category of knowing where we just, all there is is wonderment. And then there's a third category that's opinion, what beer tastes best, who should have won the Super Bowl, who's the best basketball player, it's impossible, there's no right or wrong answer to a question like that, there's only your opinion. And then there's what you want to believe. And what you want to believe is stronger than the, all other categories of knowing combined. The strongest possible kind of belief is what you want to believe. And 63 million people in the fall of 2016 wanted to believe that everything about America is bad, 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 down, 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 terrible, terrible, terrible. It wasn't just that they weren't crazy about Hillary Clinton was not the world's best candidate. We all know that. She, she could have done a much better job. But it wasn't just that they didn't think that she was the world's best candidate. People wanted to believe that the United States was falling apart. And the people who voted for Brexit in the UK, by and large, they wanted to believe that the European Union was a terrible thing for citizens of Britain. And why people want to believe this, why people want to believe bad things, 
I wish I had the answer. The only thing that I can tell you that I think is this thought line has been in American culture, not for decades, but for centuries. I start one chapter on, I have a chapter on why people want to believe bad things. And it's speculative because I don't think you can prove what people's inner motivations are. But I start that chapter by citing great works of literature, nonfiction books, novels, and plays that said that America was about to fall apart that said that everything was coming unglued and the world was ending and citing the reasons that they said, big reason that was constantly cited was illegal immigration, illegal immigrants pouring into the country, ruining our culture, how terrible everything was and how it was great in the past, back in those good old days, you know, you can never, we can never figure out exactly when or where they were, but there were good old days back in the past and the good old days are now ending. And I described these books without giving their names and then, of course, you've already guessed what the trick is. And then I tell you their names and all the books and plays and novels and other works of art that I refer to, they're all at least half a century old. And many of them are more than one century old. Things from the 19th century, great authors um, predicting that America was right on the verge of falling apart. And it hasn't happened, but this thought has been in our collective consciousness pretty much the entire time the country has existed. You've given us a lot of good things to think about, so I thank you very much for It's Better Than It Looks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.